worship this morning. Wherever you are, we appreciate that you have tuned in today to join us as we sing praises uh, to our God. Today we're going to start with a prayer. Uh, this song is a great prayer. It says, I will follow. And that's what all of us want to do today. We want to follow our Lord and Savior.
and that is to build up God's kingdom.
that you're here the, today and uh, excited about the message that God has given for this morning, and I pray it'll be a blessing to you. You know, we've been, uh, been for several weeks now in the series, Born Again, and uh, we've, we've talked about what it means to be born again and what God does in our lives after we're born again. And, and today we're talking about, can I lose my salvation, right? And that's a, that's a very serious question that a lot of people ask. A lot of people have doubts. And uh, hopefully, prayerfully, uh, this, will, this will answer some of those questions for you and, and solve some of those mysteries for you. I spent my teenage years uh, at Trinity Baptist Church in, in uh, White Haven. Uh, pastor Bill Thomas was, was my pastor for uh, most of those years. And... Uh, our church was growing just by leaps and bounds, and, and we were in process of building a new auditorium. And so one, one Sunday afternoon, we got to the church, and, uh, you know, just before, before the service began, uh, a bunch of us were talking, and, and Brother Bill said, would you, would you like to go see the new building? Because it was... You know, it was a construction zone. We couldn't go in it. And, uh, but he had asked our, <clears throat> he had asked our architect, uh, Brother Frank Rebolt, who was one of our deacons, and he said, would it be okay if I carried folks over? And so uh, Brother Frank had, had had the guys do some extra cleanup and stuff. And so everybody just left their coats and jackets and purses and Bibles and everything in their seats, and we went buzzing over to the new building to, to look at it. And so we were gone for several minutes uh, looking, and, you know, Brother Frank was pointing out this, Brother Bill was pointing out this, and, you know, just looking at a new building. And while we were gone, there were probably eight or ten people who had come in late. They walked into this empty auditorium covered with jackets and purses and Bibles. And when we were coming back through the hallways, we could hear people at the altar weeping, crying out to God because they thought the rapture had occurred. <laughs> and they thought they had missed it. Brother Bill preached regularly on the rapture, regularly on being ready for the rapture. And, and man, these folks walked in and they were terrified. They thought their only hope was to head for the hills and pray that they didn't take the mark of the beast. And they were terrified. Well, I've never been that scared. I promise. <laughs> I was grateful. I was to church on time that day. Uh, but you know, a lot of people live with a dread, with a fear. What if I lose my salvation? And so I want us this morning to look just for uh, a few minutes. And this is going to be scary because you know when a preacher says a few minutes, it doesn't mean anything. Right? But Seriously, for a few minutes, and I want to give you eight reasons that uh, God will not allow us to lose our salvation. Eight reasons that our salvation is secure in Christ Jesus. So buckle your seat belts, okay? Because we're gonna we're gonna put the pedal to the metal, and we're going through these eight reasons. And uh, hopefully there'll be a blessing to you. Number one, Jesus will not lose his own people. Uh, John tells us in, in the verses that Pastor Ronnie read for us there for just a few moments ago, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And they listen to me. I know them and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life and they will never 
perish. And that is in the continual present tense, so it actually means they will never, 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 no, not never perish. All right? And so God has us. No one can snatch them away from me. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all. He's more powerful than anybody, and nobody is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So you see, the question is not, can I lose my salvation? The question is more properly, can Jesus lose me? And the obvious answer is no. No, he cannot. He will not. You see, we, we talked last week for uh, a, a little bit about uh, how we can't earn our salvation. We can't climb a ladder for our salvation. We can't buy our salvation through finances or through baptism or anything else. Now, when Jesus called us to salvation, each one of us individually, we didn't earn our way. He chose to reach down and through his grace rescue us from our sinfulness and our wickedness. And he chose to save us, rescued us in his grace. He will not lose you. Hebrews 13, 5, Jesus said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Second reason, God is faithful when we are not. God's faithful when we are not. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, He will keep you strong to the end so that you'll be free from all blame on that day when we stand before Jesus. He returns to take us home. God will do this. He is faithful to do what he says he will. And he has invited you into the partnership with Jesus. So you see, God initiated this whole relationship. He initiated all of it. He will carry it through. He will carry us through. <clears throat> when it, it we're not able to be saved because we can keep our promise to God. Oh, God, if you'll save me, I will live for you the rest of my life. And we do until the next time we sin, right? Uh, my experience anyway, maybe not yours, but your pastor is a sinner. And I can live for God consistently until the next time I sin. And then I'm sitting there going, Lord, I can't believe I did that again. Oh, Lord, forgive me again. And you know what God says when we do that? God looks at us and he says, what again? Because when we confess our sins, he's, con he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and it cleanses from all unrighteousness every time we do that. And so, in God's eyes, when I confess that sin last time, it's gone. Scripture says God doesn't even remember it. And so God's sitting there saying, what again? What again? Because it's gone. It's gone. It's not that we keep our promises to God. We're his because he keeps his promises to us. And he said, I will keep you strong to the end. If we genuinely believed in and trusted in him to be our Lord and Savior, he keeps us believing in him. Believe into the end because he believes in us. All right? Reason number three. Our judgment day for sin is in the past. It's in the past. He 
Hebrews 10, 14. <clears throat> Scripture tells us, For by one sacrifice he is made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. He's made us perfect in Jesus. Not perfect in ourselves, but perfect through Jesus. Perfect through Jesus' blood, through Jesus' holiness, Jesus' righteousness. He tells us that he has clothed us. He has wrapped us literally in the righteousness of Christ. It's not my righteousness that takes me to heaven. It's not your righteousness that takes you to heaven. It's the righteousness of Christ that God has wrapped us in that takes us to heaven. We won't stand before God in judgment for our foolishness and our sinfulness because Jesus has already been judged for your sins and my sins. Thank you, Jesus. Right? We don't have to fear that. We don't have to worry about it. Our judgment is in the past for our sins. If we're in Christ, we're now perfect before him. Not because of our offering, but because of his offering on the cross. Now we will, as Christians, We'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The, the Greek word there is bima. We'll stand for uh, judgment, but that is for our rewards. That's not for judgment for our sins. Our sins were judged at the cross. The lost man and woman, the lost teenager, the lost child will stand before the great white throne judgment that's when God will open the books and he'll look for their names in the book of life. And if their name is not written in the book of life, then they'll be sentenced to hell. Well, why would a loving God do that? Whoa, 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 whoa. That's the wrong question. A loving God sent his only son to die on the cross for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of every person in the world. A loving God has already made provision. A loving God has already said, all you have to do is ask him. And he'll save you instantaneously and permanently. We'll stand for judgment for our rewards to lay at the feet of Jesus. But our sin has already been judged at the cross. Reason number four. No one is lost in the process of salvation. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, for those, for those whom God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, one day he will glorify. Okay? God God is not going to lose us in that process of salvation. Again, he's the one who initiated it. He's the one who's going to finish it. Theologians call this the unbroken chain of salvation. God foreknew us. God knew that we were going to trust him before we were ever born. I don't understand that. That's part of God's thoughts that are higher than my thoughts and higher than your thoughts. I don't know how God knew that, but God knew. He knew that I would trust him on January 14th, 
1967 at Trinity Baptist Church. Not because I walked into an empty auditorium, <laughs> but because I knew that Jesus wanted to come into my life and save me. <clears throat> he foreknew us. He predestined us. He put a love for God in our heart that nothing could ever change, nothing could ever take away. He called us to himself. He called us to himself. He justified us. He made us right with him through Jesus. Not through our goodness, not through our faithfulness, not through our kindness, not through our anything that we've done, but through his grace and his goodness. And one day, God will take us to heaven to be with him. I am so grateful. I am so thankful that he has done that for my life and for your life. But you see, well, what if, what if, what if I don't know all those big words that you just used? And did God, did God choose me? Scripture tells us it's not the will of the Father that anyone should perish and spend eternity in hell. But you see, God as a loving God, God as a loving Father, calls us to himself. Scripture says, it uses the word, he woos us toward himself. Same way that I, uh, I tried to woo Miss Debbie to become Mrs. Brother Tommy, right? And God woos us to himself. But she had to say yes. She had to choose me. Even after I had chosen her. And it's the same way with God. God lays it out there. Lays that offer of salvation out there. For anyone and everyone in the entire world. say yes to God's offer. You have to receive Jesus for yourself, by yourself. If I could receive Jesus for you, I would do it in a heartbeat. But I can't do that. I had to trust Jesus for myself. You have to trust Jesus for yourself. No one's ever lost in that process of salvation. Reason number five. His people have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Our relationship with God has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I love this. I love this. Paul told the Ephesian church, and you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. When you believed, you were marked with God with a seal in the person of the Holy Spirit. We were sealed in. We were sealed in. I love the, I love the, uh, the commercial where they, they use that heat sealer and they, they take a, a baggie full of water and they seal across the middle of that thing and now you've got two bags of water. And it's completely sealed. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. When in the, in the olden days, when a king would, would put his seal on a wall, they would take a candle and they drip that hot wax down there, and the king would take his signet ring off and mash it down into that hot wax and it would have the king's seal on it. And that meant that that law could never be revoked. That law could never be changed because it had the king's seal on it. It was a permanent law. <coughs> Pardon me. And God has 
God has put his seal on my heart, on your heart, the seal of his Holy Spirit. And I love this, that we've been sealed with the authority of King Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the, the, it, it, it's kind of like kind of like Aretha Franklin's song. We've been signed, sealed, and delivered. Right? Now we're not we're not completely delivered. We're not going to be completely delivered when we get to heaven, right? But we've been signed and sealed, and we're as certain for heaven as, as if we were already there. But you see, I love the Greek word right here because the 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 word that he uses that we translate here, seal, when you take and compare the that word that we that, that we've translated seal here in our Bible, and you compare it with secular documents, you know what that word is? It's the word for earnest money. When you got ready to buy your house, you put down so much earnest money to guarantee to that seller you were going to pay them the rest of it. Right? And that earnest money meant you were going to, that sealed the deal that you, would pro, you were promising to complete the deal. And that's what God has done for us. He has given us the Holy Spirit as our earnest money. I'm coming back after you. I'm coming back for you to take you to be with you. How precious and how special God has sealed us by his Holy Spirit. Reason number six, God keeps his people. <clears throat> in Jude chapter one, well, of course, there's only one chapter in Jude, right? So in Jude, verses 24 and 25, uh, Jesus' half-brother writes, now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. Oh, wow. It's not my job to keep from stumbling. It's my job to watch out for stumbling blocks. But it's not my job to keep from stumbling. That is God's job. Now unto him. Who? God himself. Now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling. Be the praise and the glory and the honor forever and ever and ever. Oh, wow. What a God we serve. He's the one who keeps us and protects us. Jude offers joyful confidence, joyous confidence in God's ability to keep us until the day that he takes us home. As rugged and as dangerous as our lives are, and for me personally, as feeble as my attempts are to live for God, God remains my rock. God remains my strong fortress. He is able to keep us from stumbling. Number seven, the Lord completes what he begins. And I've loved this verse since I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will complete it. You see God is a finisher. 
God doesn't do things just halfway. God is a finisher. He completes what he starts. And he's the one who started the good work in us. If the perseverance of the saints is dependent on the individual saint, no wonder people think they can lose their salvation. Because I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability to keep myself from stumbling. Nor do you. But God has that ability. He started that good work. He's going to complete that good work in us. God is going to keep working on us and in us until the day when we see Jesus face to face. God completes what he begins. And then reason number eight, his love for us is fixed. Love these verses. Romans chapter eight, Paul says, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that his love for you and me is fixed. It's permanent. It is set in concrete. And it will never, ever change. That is that, that is the agape love that we've talked about these last several Sundays. A love that is unchanging, a love that's unending, a love that is available to every person in the entire world. If you'll say, God, I want that love. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He set his love on us permanently. And nothing can separate us from that love. So what's our application? What's our take home? I can trust God with my forever because of his forever 